Okay, so we're going to get started, guys. We want to be right on time here. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see you all. I want to welcome you and thank you for spending your Monday morning with us for this program. <laughs> I want to thank our presenters for taking time out of their busy schedules to come and share their knowledge with us. Uh, first, let's give them a round of applause for coming out because I know they're very busy. A special thank you to Professor Kara Williams for helping us organize our panel and helping us connect with all of our panelists here. Uh, also, I'd like to thank our Psychology Club students. For the Psych Club students in the audience, please raise your hand. Any Psych Club students, raise your hand. All right, so our Psych Club students are helping usher our audience. Also, they helped us consider some of the topics that we were going to present today, so they helped us organize as well. Uh, thank you to Mitchell Baker, Professor Mitchell Baker, and again to Professor Williams, once again for helping us gather all the questions uh, that we're going to present later, and also the multimedia department for setting up all of our mics and recording this event, which will be on YouTube hopefully by tomorrow or Wednesday. Uh, and lastly, a big thank you to Dr. Walter Franzek, our, uh, our Dean of Liberal Arts, for always supporting these programs that we host every year. So our program is going to take about 50 minutes, 50 minutes to about an hour for our panelists to share their info, and then we're going to have time for 20 minutes to a half hour for time for question and answers. Now, on your seat, you have probably found a note card. And if you have a note card, those are designed for you to write down questions that you have for our panel. About 11.45, 11.50, uh, Professor Baker, who's all the way in back, raise your hand if you can. Uh, Professor Baker, and then Professor Williams, who's here too. They're gonna be collecting your questions and they're gonna try their best to try to answer your question or try to ask your question to our, to our panel here. So again, welcome to our annual mental health program. This is the eighth, the eighth year that we've done this. Every year we try to pick a different topic to address the mental health for Mental Health Month, which is gonna be in May. So this year we wanna focus on schizophrenia. And I have to say, it's probably one of the most fascinating mental disorders, one of the most studied mental disorders, but with that too, one of the most misunderstood disorders by our community. So which is why we've asked our panel of experts to come here and share their knowledge with us. And so hopefully the information that you're going to hear today will be beneficial to you, will help answer some questions, and more importantly, help you understand people that do live with schizophrenia. And, um, and if you're considering a field, if you're considering going into the field of clinical psychology, uh, this program might give you a little expectation, uh, a little idea rather, of what to expect. So with that, um, if you're interested about treatment info or anything about advocacy for, the, for uh, mental disorders, we have two tables in back, one for Metropolitan Family Services, uh, uh, showcasing their services and their agency, and we also have a table for NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, too. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, and then we're going to get started with our panel. Go ahead, Jay. Um, hello. Um, <laughs> My name is Jason Garcia. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Illinois. I've been teaching at Moraine Valley for a couple of years now, and I also work at a local hospital uh, running assessments to deem, to, to determine if, what level of treatment patients might need. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katherine Porter. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I work at Metropolitan Family Services in Palos Hills. I work with the Adult Mental Health Outpatient Program and I have worked there for a little over two years, and I've had about 10 years of work experience in the field of working with mentally ill adults. I am Dr. Morris Blunt. I am a psychiatrist who works at Metropolitan Family Services. Been there for ooh, six, seven years now, and I've been in practice now for about 14 years. Uh, hello, my name is Lisa Cardiola. Uh, I am a consumer. I am a person that lives with schizophrenia. Uh, I am also the vice president of NAMI South Suburbs, and um, I'm a community, um, I'm a connections group support facilitator and an inner own voice facili um, group Sorry. facilitator, presenter. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Ann Bethes. I'm president of NAMI South Suburbs of, of Chicago. Um, we have a lot of free 
information that is at the table in the back, so feel free to ask me any questions about our free educational programs. Thank you. Okay, just for our level of comfort here, uh, we're going to ask if there is a seat next to you that is empty. If you're in the middle, I'm going to ask you to move in one, if you guys can, please, uh, only because we have so many people in the back that are waiting to be able to sit down. So if you can, move in one, please, and we appreciate that to give everybody a chance to have a seat. Thank you. So we're going to get started now. Uh, Dr. Blunt, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, We'd like to ask you to start off if you could tell us, uh, from a psychiatric standpoint, what is schizophrenia? In a general view, schizophrenia is a severe psychotic illness which causes patients to become detached from reality. Now, to expound on that, um, what we see or what we treat in a mental health field is we see patients who oftentimes will have um, their um, being away from reality, I would say, as um, having delusions, hallucinations. They might have some bizarre speech, some bizarre behavior, and they might be withdrawn. Sometimes we call that being withdrawn into themselves. To give you a better picture of it, I'm sure some of you have been to downtown Chicago before. You've seen people talking to themselves on the street. That might be an example. Uh, you might hear of some of the more um, famous cases that have occurred when some patients might get violent, which does occur, but normally that happens when patients have substance abuse problems in addition to the core illness of schizophrenia. So basically, as a psychiatrist, we are attempting to minimize or, try, or we try to get rid of the symptoms that do occur and get these patients to function as well as they can in regular life. Thank you, Dr. Blunt. Uh, uh, in, in your experience, how is schizophrenia di diagnosed and perhaps uh, differentiated even from other psychotic disorders? I'm sure you get that question a lot. I do, I do. Uh, technically, we use in psychiatry a manual called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We are in the process of transitioning from number four to number five right now. However, um, for a patient to have schizophrenia, we look for them to have hallucinations, um, which can be auditory and visual. They might see things that are not there, or even tactile, or they might feel things on their skin that are not there. Um, they might have delusions, which are defined as being false beliefs. Um, they might have some bizarre behavior. They might dress differently. It might be 80 degrees outside, and they still might have on a thick coat. Um, they might also be more withdrawn. They might not totally connect with you or relate to you in a conversation. And this will persist over a certain amount of time. That's how we officially diagnose it. In getting a history from a patient to help us in diagnosis, sometimes we'll see if there has been any family history of schizophrenia or any other mental disorder. We might see how the patient has developed because this illness is one that tends to manifest itself in late teens, early 20s with males and maybe early to mid 20s with females. And up until that point, patients might um, develop what would be considered developing normally. So oftentimes I will see a patient who is 19, 20 years old who's coming in to see me who might have started classes here or might have gone out into the workforce and gradually had a decline. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and, and then if we can also ask you, um, how is schizophrenia commonly treated biologically, at least or from a psychiatric standpoint? Okay, um, I'll backtrack and answer the second part of your first question. Oh, yeah. How is it yes, differentiated yes. from other oh, yeah, diagnoses? Oh, yeah, differentiation, yes. Okay, with schizophrenia, the patients will have more of a persistent um, psychotic component. They might have the hallucinations and, des and delusions and also have that time of being more withdrawn that persists throughout time. Patients who might use, we'll start there with substance abuse, who might use some drugs that might um, cause some psychosis or paranoia. Cocaine is one, crystal meth is another. Um, if that drug use is not there and they still have the symptoms, then they could possibly have schizophrenia. Sometimes patients who have bipolar disorder or what used to be called manic depressive disorder, um, when they're hyper or staying up for days at a time and not sleeping, or when they're really depressed, they can also have some hallucinations. Um, also, some medications can cause some symptoms that can mimic some psychiatric, that can mim mimic sch schizophrenia. And um, one disorder I can think of offhand is called delirium. It might be something that you might see in nursing homes where older people might not recognize you or don't know the time and date when you go to see them. For the most part, somebody who's 70 years old who develops that at the age of 70 does not have schizophrenia, even though the symptoms might look very similar. So those are things that are common um, ailments that might look similar to schizophrenia. 
Um, but again, as a professional, we try to tease those out to make sure that what we diagnose as schizophrenia is actually such. That's true, yeah, it doesn't sound easy to be able to differentiate that, but getting a history and looking at a timeline would probably help us. And, and then uh, we'd like to hear a little bit about how this is commonly treated biologically, or at least psychiatrically. Yeah, um, as a psychiatrist, we are, and this is a joke, known as kind of the drug pushers in the, um, <laughs> in the industry because we do prescribe medication. The reason why we prescribe medication is that there are several theories out about what could cause schizophrenic symptoms. One is what we call the dopamine theory, thinking that patients, schizophrenic patients in their brains have overactive dopamine levels. This can lead to the hallucinations and delusions. Not to say that anybody here has tried this, but think of somebody who's been on cocaine. You notice how to get paranoid? Cocaine also increases dopamine levels, so that's one reason why we think that uh, schizophrenia might have increased dopamine levels in the brain, overactive. Um, something else that we tried to treat more recently with the newer medications will be um, looking at serotonin. Serotonin is involved in depression and anxiety, or lack thereof is. And remember that kind of being withdrawn to themselves I was describing before? That is a part of schizophrenia that's the hardest to treat. Most of the medications do a fair job of treating the hallucinations and delusions, but it's that being withdrawn, um, not having that motivation to want to do anything, not really connecting, which is the, the morbidity, we call it, call it, or what really keeps these patients from working and functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, we think if we can regulate the serotonin um, to maybe give a little bit of an antidepressant effect, that can offset some of those symptoms. Um, also, other neurotransmitters or what I call um, catches mitts in the brain that catch certain chemicals that are flying around are being studied. One is glutamate. Um, still in the studying process now, there might be some new medications coming out with that, but that also is supposedly going to help with the negative symptoms. Now, Dr. Blunt, I, there's one, one last question I'd like to, to ask you is that, you know, and I get this question a lot in my classrooms, sure. and a lot of us do. Um, say somebody's living with schizophrenia, is this a, a disorder that they may need to take medications for, for their life? As of now, yes. Okay. And the difficulty in treating this disorder, especially with people who are newly on set, that 19, 20-year-old, is um, getting them to accept the illness and th that they might have to take medication indefinitely. Okay, well, thank you. So, thank you so much for that. Let's give Dr. Blunt a hand. Thank you. Perfect. Katie, we're happy to have you with us today and uh, share some of your experiences that you've had as a social worker and a therapist. Um, what are some treatment strategies that are, common, uh, that are commonly used to help individuals with schizophrenia in your experience? Well, the most common uh, therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy. And with cognitive behavioral therapy, it is helping the person to look at the way that they think the, what the things that they believe, the thing, their mood, and the behaviors, and to try to help them to look at, are these the things that they want to do, or would they like to do things differently? To look at cognitive distortions, such as negative self-talk, I'm no good, I can't do anything, I'm, I'm hopeless. Um, also looking at um, if they have any dangerous or odd behaviors, if they've been um, going out and exposing themselves in the community, um, or if they're feeling very depressed or anxious and working on those symptoms to help them to decrease them. Cool. Also, I, I, my um, thing that I really feel is important to add is a strengths perspective. And with a strengths perspective, it's focusing on what the person can do for themselves. So rather than focusing always on the negative and thinking about the negative, that the person might always be worried about this illness, think about what can I do? What can I accomplish? What are my things that I have been able to do? I've seen a client who had schizophrenia who had one of his poems published in a book. He, he sent it in and he had it published and that was a wonderful accomplishment. Thank you, Katie. Now, I remember talking on the phone with you a few weeks ago. We talked about that some clients share delusional material. Uh, sometimes they share 
uh, psychotic material, they hallucinate, and, uh, and when they tell us about that, uh, I think maybe sometimes uh, our, our, our public might think, you know, to disregard those things. So I'm wondering, as a therapist, uh, when, when a client does tell us about delusional or psychotic material that, that, that they're presenting to us, should we disregard it? Should we perceive it as real for them? Well, we need to perceive that that is what they believe is real. That is their truth. Um, that's what they believe is actually happening. So they see things or hear things or believe things. That That's true, and you can't argue that. But what you can do is you can help them to um, see that you understand where they're coming from, why they are thinking or believing the way that they are. Um, I try to get to the root of what are they trying to say. So, for example, I um, talked to someone, and they kept saying, talking about the blood and the tears and the pool of, t pool of tears and the blood and the sweat and a baby. And they kept saying these words over and over. And to, it didn't make sense, but I tried to figure out, was that because she had been a victim of child abuse? Had she had an abortion? Was, what was the trauma involved that she kept saying these words? And I tried to reflect back to her that I understood that she must be feeling bad. There must be something going on that's making her feel so terrible. Um, and so that's a very important thing. I also make sure I show them empathy and understanding. I help them to identify the feelings. You know, when you're talking about wanting to do this, it seems like what you're saying is that you think that you're being watched and followed by the police. And so maybe there are some concerns that everyone is watching you. Do you feel like others are watching you? And that helps them to realize that someone is listening and paying attention. Thank you. I've always imagined when uh, I used to work in the mental health field uh, and, and still do. And sometimes when, when uh, clients tell me things, I, I, I believe that because uh, the brain is sending out those actual messages. Sometimes we say in class, it's as, it's as real as somebody telling you that you're not taking a 930 class. Right. And if somebody tried to convince you that you're not really in college, it would be tough to convince you out of that. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, now, as a therapist, what kind of quality of life uh, can, do you think successful treatment can bring to somebody with this disorder? Like, what might that look like in terms of functioning, being able to work, family relationships? Okay. Well, we found, um, that according to helpguide.org, which is a website, a one in five people will get better within five years of their first episode of schizophrenia. Three in five will get better, but will still have some symptoms, and they will have times when their symptoms get worse. One in five will continue to have troublesome symptoms. Um, for successful treatment, it's important let me go back to the quality of life question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Regarding quality of life, there are people that have intimate relationships, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, marriages. They have jobs. They have family, friends that they connect with. And according to schizophrenia.com website, 28% of people with schizophrenia live independently. 25% live with a family member. 20% live in a supervised housing. Um, like a SILA, a Community Integrated Living Arrangement. 10% live in nursing homes. 6% live in jails or prisons. 6% are homeless or live in shelters. And 5 to 6% live in hospitals. So, uh, but approximately one half of all individuals seek counseling and seek therapy, seek medication management. So one half are not seeking it at all and the other half are. Um, and that might account for um, where the people are living based on if they're in a jail or prison or in a living independently based on if they're seeking treatment. Um, also regarding successful treatment, it is important to continue to see your psychiatrist, take your medications as prescribed, that's extremely important, and to see a therapist on a regular basis and take an active role in the treatment process. Also make sure to communicate with the psychiatrist and the therapist. Um, the person should make sure that they're telling everything that they're experiencing, anything that they're thinking that they're concerned about, any concerns that they have. And let the, 
let the person know because if um, the therapist and psychiatrist don't know, then they don't know to look at changing medication or they don't know how to help them regarding various therapy techniques. And, excuse me, if I can just add that a better outcome is achieved when patients do start treatment early. Mm -hmm. um, we have found that when patients start treatment early, shortly after that first break and they continue the medication and continue seeing the therapist, um, they're the ones who can go out and work and live a more normal life. And um, it's also important that within that treatment plan, developing small measurable goals that the person can feel successfully that they're able to do and it will increase their self-esteem. Wonderful. And we have one last question to, to, to ask you. And then, uh, and Dr. Blunt, you might be able to, to share some insights on this too. Uh, when an individual is in crisis, is hospitalization is it always necessary? And I guess how common is hospitalization? And like on, under what conditions would, would either of you say that hospitalization might be needed for somebody in crisis? Usually if a patient is an immediate threat to himself or herself, hospitalization is required. Or if in the very near future, he or she would be in imminent danger to himself or somebody else. Otherwise, um, there are programs available, um, such as like ACT programs that the patients are in that in which they have 24-hour case management services to try to prevent the actual hospitalization. And there are also day programs. There's a psychosocial rehabilitation program where the client goes for five hours a day, five days a week. They attend various groups, um, including communication skills, symptom management, and they have that structure and uh, camaraderie of other um, people that they can relate to and so that decreases social isolation. But it's important within handling a crisis, first you want to um, identify that person's relapse symptoms. If you've already developed a relationship with that person, you might know specifically what kind of um, symptoms they're going to start exhibiting that might be heading toward a relapse. You want to help and protect them and support them. You'd like, um, it's important to remove other people from the room, from the situation, so that there feels like there's less of a threat and it's more calm environment. Um, it's a, important to make sure that you calm, that you help them to calm down and help them to see that you understand where they are coming from and what they're saying. Explain that the, to the person that their behavior may be considered dangerous or harmful and that you wanna help them to be safe. Um, and also explain to that person that other staff or police or ambulance medics, if necessary, are there to help the person and not to harm them. Um, and let the person know their rights regarding um, hospitalization and regarding their care. It's important, it's part of the HIPAA rights that um, we need to protect their civil rights to be independent and have their freedom except when there's that involuntary certificate for hospitalization. Sure. Yeah, so it doesn't sound like it's necessary every time, but, but certainly when there's a level of harm involved, then I guess we can't take any chances. Uh, yes. and, and we wanna do what's best for the client. Uh, so thank you so much. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> We're gonna move to Professor Jason Garcia here. Jason, thank you for joining us today. Uh, um, According to any of the current research uh, regarding schizophrenia, are there any causes that seem to be prominent for schizophrenia? You know, schizophrenia seems to follow uh, more of a biopsychosocial paradigm um, with a heavily focus on the, bi uh, the biological. Um, you know, one specific cause, as Dr. Blunt had mentioned, is perhaps dopamine, um, in excess of the neurotransmitter dopamine. And this is often very well treated with antipsychotics. However, it's important to note that this is specific primarily to the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Positive symptoms being hallucinations, delusions, excesses of behavior. Where schizophrenia, often uh, patients suffering from schizophrenia show negative symptomology. This would be a flat or blunted affect, uh, clang or, or tangential speech, things of this nature that don't respond as well to treatment. In fact, um, as Katie was saying, about one in five, maybe 25% of all people suffering from schizophrenia will end up I'm not cured, but perhaps never to see another symptom after treatment, and that's fantastic, with the other 75% having some type of residual complication 
for the rest of his or her life. The other 75% are very often related specifically to negative symptomology or at least um, maybe heightened elevations of stress, uh, an earlier occurrence of the disorder, meaning that they got it maybe in the late teens or even in the early teens at times. Um, other causes would be uh, they've identified a lot of things that are very genetic, such as uh, enlarged brain ventricles certainly come into place. Um, with autopsies of people suffering from schizophrenia, they find enlarged brain ventricles. Enlarged brain ventricles are the cerebral spinal areas of the, the brain. And with this being enlarged, it seems to be heavily related to poor social functioning, memory deficits, things of this nature, again, associated with the negative symptoms. And these were found in, in, in patients with schizophrenia um, in the autopsy. So th there might be a correlation there. They found other things such as the, the cingulum bundle. Uh, it's actually this collection of neurological fibers. And in this is the, <laughs> the cingulum bundle is actually a collection of fibers in the limbic system. The limbic system is heavily involved in memory, emotion, things of this nature. Its primary structures are the amygdala, the hippocampus, and this bundle of neurons within the, the axon of the neuron has significantly less myelin coating. This is genetic. Myelin coating is something that increases the speed of the neuron. Okay? So the speculation here is that if you have less this coating, the neurons can't interact with each other and well, that, well they'll, react, they'll interact, but it'll be much slower. It'll be a much less efficient neuron. And since they, they talk that way, it can definitely, uh, well, since they talk in, in such a way that's, not, that's a little more gradual than normal, mm -hmm. that it could be, it could manifest later as, as the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, another example would be, as a primary cause, uh, the unsinate fasciculus. It's, it's this, again, like a neurological structure, and it connects the temporal lobe to the frontal lobe temporal lobe being heavily important in, in visual processing, hearing, things of this nature. And the frontal lobe, of course, with cognition, recent memory, emotions, and same thing. This structure, this fasciculus, connects these two lobes, and the neurons we find don't have that myelin coating at such a high extent. So again, these neurons are operating somewhat gradually, somewhat less than they should. So there's definitely a lot of genetic causes. Um, that Dr. Blunt certainly mentioned dopamine, certainly something to keep in mind. But we also find other things like sociological causes. Uh, an example of this be, um, like the World Health Organization, they find that about seven to eight out of every thousand people suffer from schizophrenia some type in their lifetime. And they also find that for prognosis sake, we find that countries that are underdeveloped, like Colombia and India, they have a higher success rate than countries like America, uh, the UK, Russia, Japan, Ireland. Countries that we have access to these very sophisticated uh, medications and treatment plans. And given that, we, we have to say that, okay, it seems that there's some type of sociological influence on schizophrenia and its outcome. And the speculation here is that it might be related to social support, um, those countries have, they'll, they'll often, been, some of the treatment plans will bombard the person with a lot of social support. They're less judgmental with, towards their schizophrenic patients. Often in America, we're very standoffish, which is, I mean, frankly, uh, a bit saddening. You know, uh, Dr. Blunt did mention if you're in Chicago's loop and you see someone talking to themselves, most of us aren't going to go up to that person and ask if they need a hug. Um, most of us are going to keep our distance out of some type of fear or apprehension. Right, right, right. Um, kind of a little side note, there was a, uh, there was one pa there was a, there's some patients who have trouble not responding to the, the uh, hallucinations, the auditory hallucinations, will actually tell them to keep a Bluetooth in their ear. And we tell them to do that because when someone has a Bluetooth in there and you hear them talking, you assume they're on the phone. So just, just so you know, it actually works very well. Um, the psychological uh, paradigm, you know, one last thing I do want to mention is that we find that perhaps the highest uh, rate of schizophrenia for the risk would be identical twins, monozygotic twins. It's about a 48% okay, risk, and that's very, very high. But if schizophrenia was primarily biological or genetic, it would be 100% because they essentially share 100% of their genes, where it's not, it's half. So the thought process here is that people have a, a, a stress vulnerability, if you will, a psychological stress vulnerability to actually develop schizophrenia at a certain point in life due to just uh, stressful factors and other environmental influences that can 
certainly play a part on that. So they've identified an obscene amount of causes. There's really no one is correct, but you'd certainly say genetics would probably be lending towards the most significant. So it's reasonable to say that, that uh, everybody that has an equal predisposition to have a genetic link to schizophrenia, the individuals that have more stress in their life are going to be more likely for that to manifest. Yeah, stress yeah. Just yeah. is much yeah. more powerful than most people Drugs. Will, will realize, and, and drug into certainly yeah. would definitely uh, play a major part. Absolutely. Well, Jason, thanks for sharing with us the current research uh, on some of the causes, the brain abnormalities as well. And we have another question as well, if, uh, if you may. Uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, I know you've, you've uh, done a lot of work with uh, you know, treating individuals with schizophrenia, Katie, as you have as well, uh, and Dr. Blunt, too. Uh, what are some of the most common challenges uh, faced when treating somebody who is living with schizophrenia? And I, and I may ask the, uh, our three professionals here uh, to tell us a little bit about that, but we might ask you to start with that, Jason. Um, I would certainly say medication compliance is probably the most, the largest barrier. And, and this actually occurs with anyone suffering from any kind of psychological disorder. But with schizophrenia, you have to remember a lot of the antipsychotics come with some very strong side effects. And as a result, people are, are less, less likely to continue taking them. And if they don't, they could easily end up uh, being committed to a psychiatric hospital because they're a danger to themselves <coughs> or a danger to somebody else. Um, another problem would be uh, patients often underplay or blatantly lie about about self-medicating. Often patients will self-medicate using alcohol, marijuana, alcohol. using alcohol, things that, things that are readily available and essentially easily, uh, easy to afford. They'll utilize that and they won't tell you. Um, something else, uh, if a patient has, say, delusions of persecution, the most common delusion, in fact, they believe that someone's out to get them, that someone's going to hurt them, that you have a negative agenda. And as Katie said, respect for each other and, 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 and trust is, is essential. In the, therapeutic, uh, in the therapeutic realm, and it's hard to establish that when we have someone suffering from delusions of persecution. Um, okay, thank you. Any other challenges that we can think of? Thank I, you, Jason. I would say one concern is regarding suicide. Um, suicide rates, uh, suicide attempts are much higher for people who have schizophrenia than for other kinds of mental illnesses or just for other stressors. And so making sure that keeping aware of people's safety, making sure that you're asking, you know, are you feeling suicidal? Do you want to hurt yourself? Do you have a plan? It's important to ask those questions. And another thing that I find is um, continuing to make sure that the person is continuing to attend their therapy sessions right. and attend their doctor appointments. Right. Because sometimes people will say, I feel all better. I don't need to come anymore. That's true. Dr. Blunt, anything you'd like to add? Yeah. I can only add to that with yeah. the um, risk of suicide. And yeah. that tends to be higher uh, within the first few years of diagnosis because the patients are remembering what their lives were like before the diagnosis or before the symptoms. And they, ha they have an insight that things are different. And they have not yet engaged enough in treatment to see that treatment can be beneficial for them. So they're comparing oh my gosh, I'm hearing voices and not able to keep up in classes anymore to, oh, I was able to function and be number one in my class before without any problem. Thank you. And Professor Garcia, thank you for, for your comments. Now, we are extremely fortunate to have Lisa with us today, uh, who's going to share her story. Uh, Lisa, in our discussions, we, uh, you shared with us that you that you've struggled with schizophrenia and have received treatment. And so we thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, how did you find out that you needed help? Um, well, actually, um, in hindsight and looking back on my life, I think there was always something that was there. Um, I was diagnosed relatively late at 30, uh, but I had moved out of my house when I was 19, so I wasn't around my support, my, my core support. And so um, I actually had a roommate that asked me at one time, you know, does mental health, does mental illness or mental health issues run in your family? So there was something that was going on or that other people could see, but I, I think a lot of, I'm an only child. I think as I was growing up, a lot of people thought, oh, she's, She'll grow out of it. She'll grow out of her shyness. She'll grow out of her her paranoia, or um, you know, she doesn't she doesn't associate with other people very well. 
So um, as I got older, it just seemed to kind of manifest and, and kind of snowball and get worse. Um, so uh, now I have a lot of coping skills that I do use Great. to help me um, kind of work through those problems. I'm actually, it's quite a dynamic, because I, I am a very social person. Um, I like to be around people. I like to be around friends. Um, as I grown up, I, I would have a hard time um, picking, oh, I would have to say, healthy or um, groups to associate with. So um, that would not help my paranoia at, at any point in my life. So um, right now I have a really good core of um, my support system that's very healthy that helps me right now. Wonderful. So. I know you talked about some, uh, when we had spoken earlier a few weeks ago, we talked about some other coping strategies that you might use when symptoms occasionally arise. Uh, um, yes, you know, I listen to music, um, although sometimes listening to the radio is uh, somewhat hard for me, so I usually listen to my own iPod because I can pick and choose the music that's put on there. Um, I have problems with delusions when I'm listening to the radio that, the, that they're sending me messages. So um, uh, although I like listening to the radio, there are some days where I have to turn it off and I have to just listen to my own music. Um, what's really great about my iPod is that those are the music that I have chosen. And if I don't like a particular song, I can just pass on to the next one, sure, <laughs> you know? Sure. Um, I also am very artistic, so I like to draw and sketch. Um, I've been thinking of starting a, a mental health blog. Uh, I like to write. Uh, I journal. Um, I haven't done any pottery lately, but, um, but that is something that I like to. Pottery helps me focus, uh, working on the wheel. Um, it, because you have to, you have to, in order to get the the clay to center, you have to be very focused in what you're doing. Because sometimes I have a hard time focusing, so that that's a big help for me. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, anything you think people need to know about schizophrenia? Something that the public should know about this disorder, from your perspective? Um, well, yes. Um, uh, a lot of people think that we have multiple personalities. Um, a lot of it, which is really another d a disorder called dissociative disorder. Um, so no, I don't have multiple personalities or I think that I'm more than one person or have different entities because a lot of people, I've had actually people think that that's, um, a, a, I guess, a, a symptom of, of schizophrenia. Um, also, when I have, uh, I don't normally have um, visual hallucinations, but I have auditory hallucinations. And those manifest themselves in going through, like when people are speaking to me, like I also have uh, illusionary correlations. In other words, I correlate um, to two situations that they mean something and that they're, they're like, they have meaning something is usually a persecution um, against me. So those are some things that that I, that I struggle with. Um, I also struggle with delusions, um, not so much of grandeur, but of uh, d delusions of paranoid delusions um, that people are trying to get, that are out to persecute me or get me. Um, one thing that I will say is that I don't hear another voice in my head. I don't think it's another person. <clears throat> because a lot of people think that when you're hearing voices that it's, um, at least in my case, I have, heard from other people that I speak of that have schizophrenia where they, they do think that it's another person or another entity that's speaking to them, that it's a male voice or a female voice or it happens to be a person. With me, it's more of like my inner thoughts or my what's going on in my head is so intense and my, um, my circular thinking is so intense that when it manifests itself in like looking like I'm talking to myself it's like I'm working through the process of processing what's going on in my brain. Um, and so when I look in the mirror, sometimes it's like I'm, I guess you could say I am somewhat talking to myself, but it's mm -hmm. not like I'm hearing another voice. It's more of my internal thoughts are becoming so pronounced and so profound um, that I'm working through them um, in my head. And that's how it helps me actually sometimes. Um, when I'm alone and I'm doing that, that um, that's why journaling is really good for me because those internal thoughts 
that I'm having when I write it down, I can go back and look at it and kind of work through it that way, as opposed to standing in front of the mirror and trying to figure it out. Um, I think that also in hindsight, it gives me um, <clears throat> a good, really good, my own sounding board for myself so that I can separate from it for a little while and then go back to it and work through it. Um, I, and like I said, I, I can be, go through periods where I become socially withdrawn, but like I said, it's really hard for me because I am a very social person. I love to go out. I love to go to the movies. Um, I love to go hear live music. Uh, and I love to paint, and I love to be part of painting classes. So when I start to go through with the withdrawal period, I, I know that I have my support system that I can call on to kind of help me get out of those low times, I guess you could say. Well, Lisa, and, and uh, thank you for that. And, and, and one last question we'd like to you to share with us is, is there any advice that you would give to somebody with the disorder, or perhaps even any advice that you would give to families that are living with schizophrenia? Um, well, I would have to say that um, try to be as empathetic and try to keep as calm as possible and and actually listen to what they're going through. Because for the person that's going through it, it's actually, they really actually believe what they're thinking. And if you can em try to empathize with them or try to help them work through it, as opposed to, um, you know, person first language, you know, I, when I walk around, I don't call myself a schizophrenic. I am an individual living with schizophrenia. Um, so because when people are like, oh, you're schizophrenic, you know, that, that's kind of condescending. Um, uh, when my, I know that when my support system kind of listens very intently to what I'm going through, they never made me feel like I'm, they never belittle me or put me down. They don't make me feel as though, um, they kind of work me, work me through it. My cousin has this great saying that it's, um, it's possible but not probable. Um, so what I might be thinking that I'm, I, I'm being listened into on my phone, on my cell phone, for instance. You know, he can say, well, that, yeah, that's possible. They could do that. But is it probably happening to you? No, I don't think so. He, and he, actually, he's the best person that helps me through what I'm going through. Um, not to say that my other supports don't work, uh, my other support systems don't work. He just seems to be the one person that I can go to, and he just seems to get me out of it uh, more than or more or faster than other people do. Um, another thing is is that um, I think that a lot of people feel that people that live with schizophrenia are normally violent. Um, they're more of harm to themselves, I think, than they are to other people. <laughs> and I know that, um, you know, with the media that, um, with a lot of the shootings that go on and, and stuff like that, 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 that kind of heightens the stigma that is associated with mental health and mental health issues. Um, but uh, from what I found and in my experiences of being with around other people that have schizophrenia, that we're really a more of a harm to ourselves than to other people. Um, if you, if you can kind of, get into therapy and get into uh, working through your through your symptoms at an early stage you can prevent you can prevent a lot of problems coming up in the in the future Great. thank you lisa thank you for those insights and i think i can speak on behalf of everybody in this room that we're glad that you're here with us we're glad that you're that you're well and thank you for sharing your journey with us thank you <laughs> thank you give everybody give everybody a lot of inspiration. Mm -hmm. and, and, and finally, we have uh, Marianne. Marianne is uh, joining us today on behalf of NAMI. And, and, and some students have classes at 12 o'clock, uh, which is why some people are stepping away. Um, but uh, Marianne comes with us, comes to us on behalf of NAMI, the National Alliance of uh, Mental Illness. And Marianne, if you could tell us about NAMI's mission and how it supports people in the community. Okay, well, NAMI's uh, mission is to educate uh, the community. And I do want to let you know that my daughter has graduated from college. She has a, a, a degree in psych and art. I'm sorry, she has a degree in psych and art and wants to go on to be an art therapist. So there is hope. And that's what NAMI does. They want to educate families 
that if they can have a good support system for their loved one that is living with a mental illness, that they can get on with their lives. And uh, so our educational programs, NAMI is, it's about people, people who care, people who understand, people who teach, people who learn, people who want to be, to want a better life, people who want to fight mental illness and win. NAMI's out there to help fight stigma. There's a lot of stigma out there. That's why a lot of family members do not want to admit that the person that's living with a mental illness actually has a mental illness. Oh, they're just a little strange, you know, uh, they'll grow out of it. Uh, it really needs to be addressed in, in, in childhood, uh, more so as my daughter says, she thinks maybe something was going on when she was little. I really didn't recognize it. Uh, she's an only child. Uh, I think in school she was picked on, uh, you know, they because she was a little heavy. She was in a Catholic school. I actually took her out of Catholic school and put her in a Christian school where it got a little better. And unfortunately, that school closed, so she had to go back to uh, the Catholic school that was close to home. But um, I think if family members can uh, really accept the fact that this is something that's going on with your child. That's, that's the best thing that you can do and go out and get yourself educated. NAMI has a family to family class that goes for 12 weeks, it's free. Our affiliate, NAMI South Suburbs, we are all volunteers, none of us gets paid. Uh, there are affiliates that do write for grants and have paid staff. Uh, have maybe a little more a presence in the community as far as having uh, programs that, such as this, that talk about mental illness and, and bring it to the forefront so people can understand and, and not have that stigma. Uh, the Family to Family course is one of NAMI's most effective tools to help families deal with serious mental illness by providing information and understanding the courses are taught by trained NAMI members who have personally experienced the impact of mental illness on their families. Mental illness not only affects the person that's living with it, it affects the whole family. It, it, it is something that has to be addressed and you have to have a lot of empathy. This is your child. You have to get them as much help as you possibly can. We started out with uh, Aunt Martha's um, uh, community services. From there we went to Grand Prairie services. From Grand Prairie services, Lisa went on to Thresholds. Thresholds had a uh, return to school program. That's how Lisa got back to going to college and, and getting as far as she has. There is hope out there. We also have a, uh, a um, program that's called In Your Own Voice. We will go anywhere and do this program. It's a consumer like Lisa that will go out in the community and speak about their good days, their bad days, and what they're doing with their lives. We actually have our doing our in your own voice with the crisis intervention training that is being, uh, this training is for cadets that are going to the uh, jails, which are now our biggest mental health hospitals, to help take care of the people living with mental illness that are in jail. Uh, NAMI is working to get services, better services for people living with mental illness to recognize it, even if it's a, a minor infraction that they've done, uh, uh, you know, with the police department, that they recognize that it's a mental illness and maybe it can be taken care of in a, a community environment rather than putting them in jail. So NAMI's working for that. NAMI works for a lot of legislation. I don't know if a lot of you know that, that it's actually been passed that people living with mental illness, they may have be on six or seven medications. They are now only allowed four. Now, is that helping that person living with that mental illness? No. So I have a lot of literature in the back that uh, is free. Like I said, NAMI, you can go to NAMI.org and get any information about mental illness free. You can find, say for instance, you don't live in the south suburbs, you can go to uh, a certain area and find out what the location is of where you live, where a NAMI affiliate is at. NAMI is, over, uh, is 50 years old 
and uh, we're all over the state of Illinois. Lisa forgot to tell you she is on the NAMI State Board. She's one of the board members for the whole state of Illinois. I'm very proud of my daughter. She's accomplished a lot. And a lot of understanding has to be out there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. Okay. You're welcome. Now, NAMI's been around for a very long time. And uh, they're a great organization to uh, help out with any volunteering uh, that anybody would be interested in. There's some information on the back table. Now, there are note cards uh, on each of your chairs. And if you do have a question for our panel, I'm going to invite you to write the question down and hand it either to Professor Williams here or Professor Baker over here. And we're going to get started with our question and answer portion, which will take us into 1215. So if you have any questions, please offer them to Professor Williams or Professor Baker. And uh, maybe we'll take a look at a few of our questions. And, and perhaps in the meantime, as we're getting our questions together, but we have one. Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Kara. Um, Dr. Blunt, I think this is for you. Um, you mentioned transitioning from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5. How exactly are you transi transitioning? What changes are there in practice? <laughs> Technically, for um, our diagnoses at a certain date, we have to start using DSM-5. That's how we're transitioning. And in the meantime, we are learning um, the differences between the two for the various diagnoses. Great. Thank you. I guess I can continue. Um, if somebody is withdrawn in your family, is there any way to personally help them feel like they can open up? Or is it better for them to seek help from their therapist? Um, OK, I would say that, um, you know, when I became very withdrawn, my mom, um, you know, you go through a part, a portion of your, of denial when you, um, when, when first things are starting to happen. Um, cause you know, well, I shouldn't say that you, you think you're in this place where you're like, it's everybody else, it's everybody else, it's not me. And the more that you feel persecuted, the more that you're going to withdraw. Um, it's usually best that, um, you know, especially when it was first happening, it was really hard because nobody really knew what was going on with me and I couldn't really verbalize what was going on with me. Um, but um, seeking, my mom uh, really s sought to get me help. Um, and it wasn't until my first hospitalization that I realized that I really, really needed some intervention or, you know, um, so I would have to say that um, withdrawing, it, um, try to try your best to be there for the for the individual. Um, try to talk to them. Uh, try to be as understanding as possible. Um, and educate yourself. Yeah, and educate yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to add that oftentimes when um, the client is coming to therapy, it's right after hospitalization. And the case manager in the hospital has set up outpatient services so that they can continue with medication management and seeing a therapist. And so that is important that they follow up on those recommendations and hopefully family can um, advise, you know, and recommend to the uh, family member, you know, please continue on with services, this will help you. Before we get started with our next question, um, I wanted to make a, just a quick announcement for anybody that is going to be filling out CEU forms, the Continuing Education Unit forms. Uh, there's a green table all the way in the back, outside in the hallway. Um, and if you fill out a form, the certificate will be mailed to you for the one hour of CEU. So we're all set with that. And I believe Professor Baker has a question that he wants to ask. This one's for Lisa. Mm -hmm. Have you ever stopped taking medications for schizophrenia since the diagnosis? And if so, can you share what led to that decision? Um, yes, I have. Um, actually, I never, I would never say that I stopped completely, like where I, 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 
I'm a very active person, and when I was working, uh, sometimes I, you know, when you're running late, you just forget. Um, but I've never stopped them completely because I, I know that they're very, they're, they're a big help to me. Um, I don't, I know that some people feel that they, that by taking the meds, that you know, their creative process kind of diminishes. Um, I've never actually felt that way. Um, I think that it's, I think it's more, um, my medication helps me, so I don't feel that going off of them is, is a really good idea. Um, like I said, I've never gone off of them to a point where I wasn't taking them for weeks on end or months on end. Um, but I would, I would say that yes, I would. There would be a couple times when I would forget, or I would fall asleep and forget to take my night meds, um, and that's not just that just isn't a good idea to do. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I have two questions that I think have maybe similar in the same realm, so you guys could respond to both. Is there a precipitating factor that causes the onset of symptoms, and is it true that? Um, many people might have schizophrenia, but it, it might not be triggered. Um, with, with that, I think, you want to, you mind? Go, go <laughs> One ahead. moment. Um, with that, I would say that uh, the precipitating factor, um, often schizophrenia happens in late teens to early 30s. Right. I mean, it's, it's right in there. So late teens is, is a very, very stressful time. It's a time with emotional turmoil and, and uncertainty about the future. So, you know, and, and, and certainly parental pressure to figure out where you're going to go or what you're going to be. Or, and, and some parents are very, very, very dominating towards their children. They're going to say, you're going to go here and you're going to be a doctor. <laughs> you know, um, and, and that creates this, 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 this cognitive dissonance within this person. And that can certainly lead to, uh, to a bit of an onset of schizophrenia, um, especially if they have that, pre uh, that genetic predisposition that we were talking about earlier. Um, if it's later in life, often it comes as a result of uh, some other environmental problems. Uh, loss of a spouse, uh, loss of a, of, of a job, some other event in which you're feeling under a great deal of duress and, and your body it copes with it in, in such a way. And when it does come later in life, often the treatment, it is, you're less responsive to treatment very often. So it can get tricky. Sorry, Doctor. Yeah, and no, that's fine. What happens in our society at the age of 18 or 19? People are going off to school. They might be going to the military. They might be getting that first job, which is good, but it's also stressful. And even that good stress can cause, well, we think can precipitate that first um, psychotic or positive symptom kind of break. Oftentimes, though, do remember that before patients have the psychotic break with the positive symptoms, they've often had months to years of being more withdrawn, um, not being themselves, finding they can't keep up as much. So sometimes as psychiatrists, it's important for me to hear from the patients or from their families, okay, well, how did patient A do in school. Well, you know, until the 10th grade, everything was okay. Then she went from being a straight A student to B or C student, um, or she stopped hanging around with her friends. And then at 18 or 19, when she left to go to college, then she had to be hospitalized. That kind of helps to solidify the diagnosis. And you were saying earlier too about the um, societies in which there's more social support. We're right, you know, you go off to college and unless you know some people there, you're there on your own. And it takes time to build that support in that new environment. The same thing with a new job. You might meet some friends there. You might have a good boss. You might not. But all that can contribute. I mean, college is stressful just to begin with. A lot of the workload, new classes, yeah. you know, getting a new environment, and especially considering going away to a, going away to college is an extra level of stress now. Uh, you know, maybe perhaps living on your own for the first time and, and taking this large responsibility. Right, and I think this is where education for the family is very important because how many times did I hear growing up of somebody who supposedly went away to school and supposedly went to a party and something happened and they haven't been the same since? Well, looking back on some of those people that I've heard of, they have since been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I think part of it is societal non-acceptance of that actually happening at that point in life. I don't know if you found that out yourself in your experiences. Um, well, actually, um, I moved out when I was 19. And um, I always had a difficult, well, I, like I said, I was always kind of shy and stuff when I was growing up. But, um, but when I moved out when I was 19, it was very stressful for me. Um, 
you know, I thought I would be okay because I was an only kid and, you know, I was always used to being alone. But um, I went from being at home with my, with my family to moving in with roommates. And that was like, I mean, that was just, uh, you know, I, I didn't have anybody growing up to bounce off, to, uh, bounce off of. Like, I didn't have siblings to, to work things out with or work things through or having any um, communication skills or socialization skills with them. Um, and I had, uh, I always had problems communicating with other, with kids my own age. So when I, here I am and I'm, when I moved out and I, ha I have these roommates and I'm trying to um, kind of assimilate to being on my own, but also having to work through things with, you know, it wasn't like I moved out on my own and I was just all completely on my own. But even even in that situation, I was having a hard time and struggling. Um, uh, keeping a job, holding a job down was really hard for me. Um, uh, money, I, I, I had a hard time uh, you know that that was another another thing. I was I was out on my own and I wasn't making very much money. And you know, uh, I, a lot of people took advantage of me because I'm very nice and I always want to be accepted. Um, but I but when I moved out, I think that that's when the crux of everything happened. And then right around the time that I really got out of full blown psychosis or mania. Uh, I was working at the time, and my grandfather died, and it was right after 9-11, which was a very traumatic event for the whole nation. Um, and uh, the Patriot Act and all that stuff started coming in, and I lost my job, and I had to move back home. So I went through a, a really tremendous amount of friction and stress. and stress in my life, and that's when my first full-blown psychosis like really really manifested itself so um, I would say that you know um, being out on my own and not being around my mom and not being around my family and not being around my support system and trying to make it out on my own and and struggling so much um, that it just finally took its toll and I finally you know finally the symptoms came on so Although it sounds like, too, with the right support system and uh, with psychoeducation and with treatment, the prognosis for most people can be good. Yes. It, yes, that is true. Um, I'm doing much better now. I mean, I've, uh, I went through community college. Uh, I, went through the, I went through St. Xavier University. I have two. Um, I have a bachelor's in psychology and a bachelor of studio arts, and I'm hoping to go on to a master's program for art therapy. So I am doing much better now. I do a lot of speaking engagements for Inner Own Voice through NAMI South Suburbs. And um, right now we're not, we currently don't have a, um, a connections group, but I also am a facilitator for NAMI Connections, which is a support group for people that have mental health issues. And um, so we're hoping to kind of put that program back into back into play for our affiliate. Professor Baker, you can ask our next question, I believe. Sure. Um, this individual asked, how, how often does schizophrenia occur with other mental health conditions? And, um, and if so, uh, are there some early signs that, uh, might, that one might be experiencing schizophrenia? So it's kind of two questions. One, are there, does it come along with some other mental health uh, conditions that you find, and are there some symptoms that you might have at the onset? Well, as Dr. Blunt mentioned earlier, um, depression is definitely one that could be uh, a comorbidity. Um, about about six to eight percent of people suffering from schizophrenia actually end up uh, committing uh, suicide, and that's that's a very very high number. And the estimations are about twenty to twenty five percent attempt. So this is a major, major concern. Um, regarding, oh, really quick, uh, there's, there's substance abuse that is definitely very common. Uh, the reason being is the patients haven't yet learned how to adequately cope with their disorder. So they'll, they'll turn to some other legal means that's, that's easy to obtain. Certainly alcohol would be a, a major factor. Um, you know, they have, uh, there's paranoid personality disorder uh, and that actually would something that'd be manifest to kind of answer the second part of the question at a very young age because personality disorders they, they kind of manifest a bit early they show early signs and they 
progress throughout the lifespan and, and they become chronic and pervasive. That's just what a personality disorder is. Um, certainly uh, anxiety disorders, OCD, panic disorder, um, often this might come as, as a, bit of a, a bit of a response to the schizophrenic symptomology. The speculation here would be that if someone's hallucinating, maybe hearing voices, they get very nervous and, and they think initially, that, wow, I, I, am I going crazy? What's going on here? And they need to cope and deal with this. And if they can't, they, they end up with this anticipation about losing control. And then anticipation certainly can cause anxiety uh, to the point where it spawns into a panic attack full blown. And they might end up with panic disorder uh, with or without agoraphobia. So there's a large amount of disorders that can certainly run comorbid with schizophrenia. So in your experience, that's what you often find, is that there's multiple things going on, not just the schizophrenia diagnosis? Certainly, correct. Uh, certainly, there'd be a polydiagnosis, uh, very common for depression, very common anxiety, very common for substance abuse. Those three specifically. Okay. Thank you. Would anybody else like to add to that? Or? Um, yeah, yeah okay. being that, okay. I, that I have a mental health, uh, that I'm living with schizophrenia myself, um, I would have to say stress is a very big thing. Yeah. Uh, depression. I have uh, attempted suicide twice in my life. Um, so, uh, yes, there are other compounding things. I've never had a substance abuse disorder um, where, I was, where I've been duly diagnosed or anything like that. But, um, but depression, I would have to say, runs very closely with mine. When, I, when I'm in my manic stages, uh, or I should say, when I'm in my, my delusional stage, um, the depression can get worse, especially if I'm, if I'm, parent, if I'm in a, para, um, a paranoid delusion, um, where it manifests itself as I'm, I'm thinking somebody's out to get me, I'm thinking you know, they're out to persecute me, they're out to get me, and they're trying to take my job, or they're trying to um, harm me or hurt me, or, or they're talking about me. That, that weighs heavily on, uh, on, my, on my heart, you know, and it, 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 it compounds the depression, so they kind of coexist with one another. Thank so you. Thank you. I think we might have time for perhaps one or two more questions. Um, how is schizophrenia treated differently in adults than children? Oh. I don't see children myself, however, a big difference is that there are not a lot of medications officially approved uh, for use in children. Um, companies have to really um, go after, so to speak, a, an FDA indication for child usage. That being said, a lot of child psychiatrists will use um, the medications, usually at lower doses. However, children tend to metabolize medications more quickly than adults do, so even though the doses might be lower, they might not be as uh, minuscule as you would think, considering a 10-year-old kid might be taking the same medication that a 35-year-old adult is taking. Okay. But some, some, a lot of the same medications are used. And, and I think I might have a question to, to uh, dovetail off of that. Um, is this a disorder that requires medication? And I know we talked about that's pr the primary treatment for, for schizophrenia, although I've, I do have students and, and community members ask me often, is this a disorder that may not need medication? For the vast majority of the patients, uh, medication is needed. There are a few patients who might have had, using the ODSM for the um, chronic paranoid schizophrenia, par chronic paranoid schizophrenia, who are paranoid but still able to function. Um, they might not have a lot of friends, they might be suspicious all the time, but they're able to live on their own and pay their bills or what have you. But um, yeah, most patients, the vast majority, will need medication and definitely. Okay. okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, I think we have time for, for one or two more. And um, Kind of along that line, I'm not sure if, how well you guys uh, would be able to speak on this, but are there any connections between the American, typical American diet and symptoms of schizophrenia? Wow. And if so, what type of foods and drinks might exacerbate those symptoms? And are there any uh, foods or, uh, that may benefit the symptoms that are not a controlled uh, medication? That I don't know of. However, <laughs> a lot of our schizophrenic patients do not have um, the best of diets. Some of that is due to access to some good food. Some of it is due to cost, as um, was alluded to before. The other thing we have to mention, too, is that the vast majority of patients with, schizoph with schizophrenia will smoke. So that in itself leads to some, leads to some comorbidities, such as um, blood pressure issues and diabetes, that kind of thing. True. To, uh, to piggyback off that a slight amount, I would say that um, 
with schizophrenia, uh, often patients do, do not have the healthiest of diets, but also in the development of schizophrenia, meaning that it's listed as one of the causes, the speculation is that there was a poor prenatal diet. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and this could certainly, you know, uh, affect the, the development of, of proper brain structures and neurological activity. So I, I find myself wishing I was a holistic, uh, I find myself wishing I was a holistic medical doctor, but I'm not. So um, <laughs> the question, the answer would be that the research is definitely more needed on that subject. Um, and we know that diet affects the prenatal development and, that, and, and not so much post-prenatal, postnatal. Yeah, certainly a good diet can't hurt. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the body well. Uh, any other questions? I think we have time for one more, and then uh, we'll, we'll end our program, and you know, and, and we'll thank everybody. Mitch. Yeah, I got one more. Uh, this individual is uh, seems like a more personal question. Um, what's the difference between schizoaffective disorder and schizophrenia? Excellent. This individual Excellent. has a relative that lives with them uh, and is living with schizophrenia and when they do not take their drugs, becomes belligerent and argumentative, and if you have any insight in how they might be able to handle that situation, they would appreciate it. Okay, a patient with schizoaffective disorder at some point during the, during the illness will have a full depress, depressive episode and or a full manic episode. However, um, within the illness, they have to have, I believe it's a two week time period in which they have psychotic symptoms. They, may have, they might have the delusions and hallucinations. They gotta have that two week period of having the psychotic symptoms in addition to, I mean, without having the mood symptoms at that time. As far as treatment, the medications we use these days are very similar. Um, what was the other part of that? Uh, if you have any insight on helping them uh, with the, the relative that lives with them, when they don't take their medications, they become belligerent and argumentative, and if you have any insight on how to help. Yeah, a lot of times it's convincing patients that they do need help, and how to do that, gosh, there's so many ways, and I'm sure the other panelists here could help me um, with that one is for them to realize how they're not taking medication is not helpful to their lives. If they realize, or they're made to realize, let's say that when they were without their medication, they lost their job. Sometimes that could be helpful. Or if when they were not taking their medication, their friends were not around them any longer. And I like to also remind them that they would like to decrease the number of hospitalizations and remain out in the community that taking their medication will help them to remain in the community and hopefully not be hospitalized. I would say um, try to remain as calm as possible. I know that that's really hard, especially when they're being belligerent and, you know, um, try, to, try to find out, well, why, you know, try to find out well, what, where is this anger coming from? You know, try to get to help them get to the root of it. Um, maybe, maybe just, you know, just, I'm here for you. Can you, you know, if you need to rant, go ahead and do so. I'm just, I'm here. You know, if you can give them a sympathetic ear and try not to be condescending to them, the calmer that you remain, the calmer that hopefully that they're, hopefully that they're calmed down, you know, because if, if you react to them as they are acting, uh, you know what I'm saying? Then you're going to exasperate the, and and it's going to make it worse. So if you can, uh, the calmer that you can remain, the be the more the better for the the individual. That's great. So. Thank you. Welcome. I think uh, <laughs> Professor Garcia wanted to say one last thing, and then we'll and then we'll finish our program. Kind of to, to piggyback off of what Lisa was saying. Um, in, the, in these situations, it's certainly very, very important to make sure the person is very aware of their coping skills and their abilities. Right, right. With depression um, or mania, you know, the mood disorders, you certainly have this, this interesting mix of, of highs and lows, and they can sometimes come out of nowhere. So with depression, you know, we need to make sure that we, they often self-isolate. We need to try to combat that to the best of our abilities. Um, certainly utilize um, a cognitive uh, behavioral record, maybe, so that you can get them to focus on their thoughts and and kind of learn who they are, which is fantastic that Lisa said she was keeping a journal. That's really how you do that. I, I assure everyone in this crowd, you will learn so much about yourself if you just keep a journal. I, I promise you, it'd be very interesting to go back and read your thoughts. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, with mania, I, I've heard a lot of interesting outputs for it. Um, certainly um, any kind of athletic or, or, or situation that requires a lot of energy, if you can get the, the person who's suffering from mania to focus his or her energy, it can really benefit them. And lastly, a lot of us have smartphones, and we can, or even not even a smartphone, any given cell phone, has an alarm clock. You can set this to, 
ha say, you know, oh, take this medication at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's often people simply forget. That's it's just something, something they need to put in their routine, and it's not that easy to establish routine. And this could actually certainly help them and benefit them, and frankly, they won't have an excuse during treatment. So it, it can certainly help. Excellent. Thanks. Well, I'd love to thank our, I, I want to, well, again, thank our panelists for being here. and. sharing their expertise with us. A phenomenal program. Thank all of you for being here and joining us and spending your morning with us. Uh, thanks again to the Psychology Club students for helping, to Professor uh, Williams, Professor Baker, Liberal Arts Department. Every, we, we couldn't do these programs without our support. I just wanted to mention that NAMI is starting their family to family class this coming Wednesday. My phone number is on the flyer. So if you have anybody that's interested, uh, it's a free program, and all uh, they get a book about this big, so it, it's worth the education. Thank Wonderful. you. Sorry to get to all the cards. I appreciate yeah. you taking the time to fill them out, though. Thank you.